Well, welcome to another webinar with the Renegade Institute for Liberty at Bakersfield College. My name is Matthew Garrett, and it's my pleasure to host our guest this evening. But first, a little housekeeping. Uh, the Renegade Institute is a cohort of Bakersfield College faculty who are dedicated to ensuring viewpoint diversity on campus and promoting such ideas as individual freedom, open discourse, and critical thinking. We work to bring in speakers who challenge the prevailing narrative. Neither our guests nor our faculty group claim to speak on behalf of Bakersfield College. This and other Renegade Institute events are provided to the campus and community free of charge. If you find this event valuable tonight, I hope you will contribute a donation to the Renegade Institute by way of the Bakersfield College Foundation. Our guest tonight popped onto our radar when he authored several pieces that articulated many of the concerns faculty expressed about recent diversity trainings mandated at our college. In the aftermath of George Floyd's death, a wave of diversity, equity, and inclusion programs spread throughout higher education. Well-intended academics and administrators raced to impose a variety of new strategies, including diversity training. Sadly, these efforts are often haphazardly created without thoughtful consideration of the way they tend to silence discussion and open discourse. In response to that one-sided narrative, we're thrilled to invite our guest this evening. Tonight's guest is Hope College Professor of Political Science, Dr. Jeffrey Paulette. His research and publications center on American and European political thought, religion and politics, and constitutional law. Dr. Paulette also serves as director at the Russell Kirk Center, editor for the Front Porch Republic, and is a frequent contributor to popular mediums such as the Acton Institute, uh, Liberty and Law, and others. This evening, we will hear from Dr. Paulette and then open the floor to questions from the audience. We thank you for joining us tonight. And Dr. Paulette, we're excited to hear your thoughts about the state of higher education, diversity trainings, and any other musings that you might have. Sir, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Matt. Um, I, I, it's been a while since somebody has been excited to hear my thoughts. So it's a real pleasure to have this opportunity. And I have to say, uh, I, I'm struck by the juxtaposition between your name, Renegade Institute, and uh, being on a college campus and supporting things such as open expression, freedom of thought, uh, free inquiry, and so forth. Uh, these are not what I would regard normally as renegade ideas. Uh, I would hope that these would be uh, central ideas of, of any college campus. Um, but alas, that is not the world that we live in. And uh, we have to kind of figure out how to make sense of the world that we live in. Um, those of us who are committed, uh, and, and first of all, I just want to thank you for um, inviting me. And, and uh, I, I think more, now more than ever, it's important that uh, like-minded people try to figure out these kinds of venues. I'm not much of a computer guy in general, but, but it actually does create an opportunity to do things that we otherwise would not be able to do. Uh, so what I'd like to do is maybe spend uh, a little bit talking about the essays uh, that Matt referred to, um, and then really just kind of make a conversation about things. Um, I'm in the process of completing my 32nd year in the academy uh, as, a, as a college professor. And um, so I've seen a lot of changes take place. And one of the things that always gets my attention or that has long gotten my attention in uh, college life is when uh, certain words that never had currency before are suddenly on everyone's lips. And, uh, you know, I can give you a couple of quotidian examples and I can give you some more serious examples. For a quotidian example would be something like the word robust. Uh, you know, some time ago, you know, five years ago, nobody was using the word robust. And now everyone is using, everything has to be robust all the time. And so when that happens, I'm a political theorist, uh, you know, and, and definitions mean everything to us. And I'm like, okay, so why, why are people using the word robust all the time? Um, inclusion, 
is an interesting example of a word. Um, 10 years ago, nobody was really using the word that much. And then you start seeing it pop up here and there. And you're like, okay, what's going on here? Why is this word getting traction all of a sudden? Um, and and it, it's hard to make an argument, for example, against inclusion and say, well, you know, I don't want it. whatever else is the case. I don't want to be inclusive, you know. Uh, and diversity is kind of one of those words also, you know, so kind of depending on what you mean by it, you sort of say, uh, you know, I mean, it's kind of a fairly innocuous word. The word that's not innocuous is the word equity. And uh, I, I wrote an essay on that in Law and Liberty. Matt mentions that I write for Law and Liberty sometime. I wrote an essay last year on um, this use of the word equity uh, because this happened really in the last three or four years that the word equality got replaced by the word equity. And um, that was just one of those moments where I thought, okay, what's going on here exactly? Why suddenly is this word getting so much traction? And uh, what's being implied by it? And what are the goals? What's involved? What, what do people hope to accomplish by using that word, uh, which is a very odd usage, actually, if you think about it. Um, equity is what we build in our homes. Uh, it's a, a, a kind of property, financially based term. It's not something that we would normally associate with uh, the organization of social life or social institutions. Equality would be. Um, and it goes back to this, uh, I, I, I think, uh, Craig Furlich, who was a uh, business professor at the uh, University of Cincinnati, created this um, picture, this cartoon, with people standing on a box watching a baseball game. And everybody knows this thing now, right? And, and, and equality is when everybody's standing on the box, but they're all different heights. Um, and so um, one of the free riders... Can, can watch the game with the fence. The other two are kind of out of luck. And then they rearrange the boxes and then, uh, and that's equity, right? You rearrange the boxes or actually uh, current iterations of the cartoon have the fence removed completely. Um, and these are, to, to me, these are always interesting things. Like what is going on here? What's being assumed? Why is, the, what, what, what is it that people are trying to accomplish? And what is it that we can interpret from within this that they're not even paying attention to. So for example, um, uh, who's rearranging the boxes or who's tearing down the fence? Who built the fence in the first place? Uh, who put the players on the field? Why do people wanna watch players in the field? Why is it that in that cartoon, we see the three people standing by the fence, but we don't see their faces. We don't know how they got there. We don't know anything about them. All we know about them is their height. So we're focusing on an accidental characteristic that they possess, right? an accident of birth. Right? They're, they're of varying heights. And we're led to assume that this is the only important thing about them. And we have to rearrange things in conjunction with this one characteristic that they possess. Uh, and I thought, well, that's kind of interesting insight into how equity works. So we have on our campus, and as I suspect, based on my correspondence with Matt, that you have on Bakersfield's campus and so forth, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is the holy trinity of contemporary uh, education. When I first got into higher education, the holy trinity was race, class, and gender. Um, I kind of longed for the days when people talked about class. Right. And, and, and they thought this was a serious issue. Like, yeah, well, because I kind of think it is. And uh, it seems uh, not that many people do anymore. Uh, so we have on our campus and a lot of other campuses, this construction of this diversity, equity and inclusion, what, what, what I call, call the uh, diversity industrial complex. Uh, and it is um, there, it, it just has this incredible mission creep about it. Excuse me. So at first you had this kind of small office, one person in charge of diversity. 
And then you had two people in charge of diversity and equity. And then you had three people in charge of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then you had five people in charge of these things. So uh, on our campus, I have witnessed, I, I've been at Hope now for almost 20 years, and I have witnessed um, this utter proliferation of these offices centered around uh, these kinds of, of questions. And um, so we have a vice president in charge of uh, cultural, uh, cultural excellence. Um, and, and her main job as nearly as I can tell it is to redefine the meaning of excellence um, so that it's actually not excellence anymore. Um, so I, I kind of puppishly refer to it as the Office of Cultural Mediocrity uh, because we're trying to level everything downward. Um, so anyway, we, we have this massive growth in administration um, and particularly in the student life division on our campus. And what has been interesting to me is the aggressiveness of people in our student life division on these kinds of questions. If I'm hosting events on, question, uh, on campus, I will get emails from them saying, um, you're not meeting our criteria for diversity and inclusion. And I usually write back uh, an email saying, I don't tell you how to do your job. Don't tell me how to do my job. And that gets them really upset. Is there a problem here? I said, yeah, there's a problem here. You commented on something and I responded to your comment and somehow I'm the troublemaker here. Um, you know, as I like to say, um, uh, when you raise, you're getting pummeled all the time. And when you raise your hands to defend yourself, people say to you, why are you being so aggressive? Like, why? <laughs> right? You're the one who is pummeling me. I was just trying to do my job. I was minding my own business. And, uh, you, you know, you, you uh, started telling me that I wasn't meeting this uh, sliding scale that you have going on that is always uh, enforced ex post facto. You know, it's like, after I've committed the crime, you tell me, oh, by the way, that was a crime. Well, forgive me for not knowing in advance that that was going to be a crime. But anyway, we've had this massive expansion of this. And, and to be fair to the people in these divisions, uh, some of this is being driven by accreditation agencies. Some of this is being driven by Title IX offices, which do have serious compliance issues that they have to deal with. I, um, I, I, I have spent quite a bit of time talking to our Title IX officer. Um, she's a good person. I don't have anything against her personally. Um, and at one level, she's just doing her job. Uh, but that's in part the issue. However, around these kind of legal and accrediting requirements, people espy an opportunity to build out around it and to um, expand uh, the sort of requirements that are in place. And so one of the things um, that I've uh, done over the years is when people say, well, you know, we have to do this because of accreditation or we have to do this because of, of legal requirements, as I will say to them, show me the law. Show me the actual part of the legal code that requires that we do this. Or show me the actual report from the accreditation agency that, should, that says that we should do this, that we must do this. And um, a lot of times they're not able to do that. Like, well, okay, so it's not required. Oh, so when you said it was required, that wasn't true. Well, technically, right? I mean, you know how this goes. Um, and uh, part of that has been, uh, I, 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 as I said, there's been this expansion of the apparatus on the one hand, uh, but there has additionally been this kind of mission creep. And that is um, that what might, actually be a legitimate issue to begin with, just kind of generally expands. And, um, um, and it's always incremental. Um, so again, I, I've been doing this for a while and it's always these incremental little things. So for example, um, with regard to hiring, um, some years ago, uh, you know, we were told, 
you need to intentionally um, include minorities and women in your hires. Fine, no problem with that. And it was, you need to intentionally go out and find, like if, if they're not applying, that's not good enough. You need to go and make sure that they're applying. I was department chair when this was going on. You need to go and make sure that they're applying. All right, I, I'm not sure I can force someone to do something they don't want to do, but I'll, I'll go out on my way and, and, and make this happen. Fine, right? Um, I'll, I'll do that. Um, you need to make sure a certain percentage of your final candidates are uh, historically marginalized, you know, female minority candidates. Okay. You need to make sure that a certain percentage of the people you actually bring on campus are female and minority candidates. Okay. Um, and then we got an instruction from our uh, provost um, maybe four or five years ago. And uh, she said, look, we're, we're going to deal with this crisis in hiring that we have um, by placing on every faculty search committee a minority member from an other department um, who will be involved in the search and will ensure that diversity concerns are being attended to. So this is kind of why I'm persona non grata on my campus in some ways. I raised my hand. This is at the faculty meeting. I raised my hand. And I said, uh, okay, okay, yeah, I, I get that. Um, 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 do we know for a fact that minority candidates are being discriminated against in initial reviews of files? So because I've been on a number of searches, then it has not been my experience that minority candidates are being discriminated against in the hiring process. So do we have evidence that this is actually a problem? Well, we don't have enough, uh, you know, a high enough percentage of minority. I, I said, that's fine. Do we have evidence that discrimination is actually taking place? Well, no, we don't actually have evidence that discrimination is taking place. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Right? Um, um, do we know that putting a minority candidate, uh, faculty member from another department on our um, search committees will, will solve a problem we don't know if we have or not? Right? Well, no, we don't actually know that. Do we know that this will place an additional burden on our minority faculty members? Because they'll all be plucked out of their departments and place them like, are we concerned about what this means for our minority faculty members, that they're going to be burdened with this task? Um, well, it's really important that we do this. It's a, it's a best practice, right? That's, that's another one of those phrases, by the way, best practice. Yeah. It's a best practice. Oh, yeah. No, it's a common practice. Uh, there's a difference between a common practice and a best practice. Uh, I know everybody's doing it, but everybody's doing a lot of stupid stuff. Um, and then, uh, uh, um, will this person be a voting member of the committee? Oh, well, we hadn't thought about that. Oh, well, we want to give that some thought. <laughs> you know? That seems pretty important. If you're going to have somebody from another discipline voting on a hire uh, within a particular discipline, seems to be something you'd want to talk about. But it, the idea was in part this kind of gesture. You know, we want to make sure this is a best practice. We want to make sure um, that we're doing things. And, 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 and it twisted the practice, the, the hiring process in all kinds of ways. Then um, that not being enough, the next thing that we did is any person on campus in, 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 involved in any search for any position has to go through training. Um, and, and that's why I think I, Matt uh, kind of come. We have to be trained. Okay. Um, I've been doing this for almost 30 years. Um, experience seems to me to be a pretty good trainer in its own way. What is someone from this office on campus who has never been a faculty member, 
doesn't know anything about the discipline, um, um, has no experience really in faculty hiring, going to tell me who's been doing this for 30 years. So I'm not saying I'm infallible, um, but in a certain sense, this training uh, thing is um, a, a kind of what Michael Oakeshott would call a kind of rationalist impulse. Uh, the substitution of technique and method for experience and cultivated wisdom. Um, I, I was talking to a student of mine the other day uh, who had been appointed to our uh, search committee for a new provost. We were hiring a new provost. And uh, so we have a good relationship. She's talking to me about some stuff. And I said to her, well, I'll tell you what, I never would have put a student on that committee. I said, well, like, why not? Why wouldn't you put a student on that committee? I said, because you guys don't even know what a provost is. You don't know what a provost does. You don't know why it matters. You have no experience or knowledge in these things. Why would I give you an equal voice in this process? And she said, well, what makes you think that you're qualified to do this? I said, well, an advanced degree and 30 years of experience, <laughs> right? 30 years of dealing with provosts. I kind of know by now. Um, so I think part of this is this kind of technical rationalized view of knowledge and how um, an academy operates versus a, uh, um, a, a more prudential experienced view of how judgments are made. Um, the experience potential view, I think, is consistent with the longstanding older view of what an academy is. And that is this kind of cumulative wisdom, cumulative knowledge that gets passed on from generation to generation. The other view is this highly technical view. You just have to have the right practices that have been tested in the right sorts of ways. Um, and then uh, you can put together these training programs and you subject training uh, people to these training programs and you produce the right sorts of outcomes. Um, and what's interesting about that, and this is what I argue in the pieces that Matt was mentioning uh, earlier, is they don't actually do what they claim to do. Uh, so for example, at Hope Now, as I mentioned, uh, we all have to take um, uh, training if we're gonna be involved in any kind of hiring whatsoever. And uh, one of the things I have done when I get these directives from the Dean or the provost office or something like that, they'll say, you have to do X. And um, I think it's the Chronicle of Higher Education piece, Elizabeth and I say, um, it's, uh, it's always, uh, we are excited to offer you this amazing opportunity. You have been mandated to. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, I'm always excited when I'm mandated, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, so th they'll say, you know, you, you are obligated to do this, this training. And my response will typically be, okay, okay. What happens if I don't? What do you mean? I, I said, no, I, I'm not saying I won't do it. I'm not even saying it's a bad idea. I just want to know what happens if I don't do it. Um, and so this happened, the first time uh, I ran into a, uh, the hiccup with this was about five years ago. I was talking with my dean who was telling me about some kind of training session I had to go through that was clearly, clearly um, unrelated to any kind of discernible end. Um, it was just uh, some apparatchik somewhere justifying their existence. And I said, okay, I, I understand that you're making this a, a, a compulsory. I want to know what happens if I don't do it. And he says, well, what do you mean? I said, well, what happens if I don't do it? He goes, well, you have to do it. I said, well, I don't have to do anything. Um, uh, you know, anytime you say I have to do something, there is always this idea of um, there's some sort of punishment involved if I don't do it. Uh, you're making this compulsory. What happens to me if I don't do this? And he was buffaloed by this question. And he said, well, I, 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 nobody's ever asked that before. And, and I said, and that's a problem. Uh, that people just immediately comply without uh, 
because it's easy, right? All right, it's an hour. I'll put up with it for an hour, and then I'll just go about my business. We all know it's bull, uh, but we'll put up with it and we'll do it. And, and so in part, the system perpetuates itself uh, precisely because people are not willing to sit there and say, you know what, what if I don't do this? What if I, what if I think that this is just wrongheaded? So, so um, this happened a second time with the same dean, and he said, if you don't do it, you will not be eligible for a merit increase. Like, okay, all right. Now I know the stakes. Right. I, I'm, I'm glad to know the stakes. Um, uh, okay, so um, what happens if I can prove that the training programs that you have in place don't actually measure or determine what they claim to do. Doesn't matter. What happens if I can prove that there is no discernible relationship between the training program itself and desired outcomes? Doesn't matter. What if I can prove that the training programs actually produce more adverse outcomes that you would be opposed to than positive outcomes that you want to embrace. Doesn't matter. Um, and uh, what I detected was um, this um, absurd resistance to even asking the questions. So now part of our um, search committee training is we have to do this implicit bias training. and. Um, all the, I, I mean, there is so much, uh, there have been so many meta studies on implicit bias training um, that I, for, for my money, have proved conclusively they don't do what they claim to do. The people who developed the implicit bias test explicitly said, we can prove no correlation between implicit biases even if we could detect them, and we know there's a reliability problem here, but even if we could detect them, we're not saying there's any correlation whatsoever between implicit biases and discriminatory practices and outcomes. Like they, were, they, they said that explicitly in the initial studies. There's no connection between these two things. And yet we act all the time as if there is. Um, and, and I think part of the problem is uh, we get cowed. Uh, you know, people are just not willing to say, wait a minute here. Um, uh, what evidence do you have that we are actually engaged in discriminatory practices on our campus? Like, just show me the evidence. Uh, well, um, we're having a hard time retaining uh, minority faculty. <clears throat> Well, maybe that's because we're making them serve on committees all the time instead of getting their research done. <laughs> Have you ever thought of that? Like, they, like that's, that's a tax, right? I mean, that's taxing. You have to serve on all these faculty search committees all the time. Um, uh, so it, it, it's this kind of resistance to questioning, resistance to investigating assumptions, resistance to investigating connections, um, that was just striking to me um, when I was going through this stuff. And, and, um, and again, uh, Matt kindly, um, when he contacted me, said, you know, I thought this was interesting and, and I'd like you to talk about this, um, <clears throat> what was um, to say that, um, first of all, frequently, um, there are many of us who end up saying things we don't actually believe. Um, and um, doing things that we know don't hold up. Um, but it's the path of least resistance. Um, so we do it. And of course, the thing gets perpetuated because nobody questions it and, and nobody resists it. <clears throat> um, the bigger problem is, um, and, and this is what, and it's already 9.30, and this is what Matt wanted me to talk about, what was the difference between training and education, right? Training is what you do with dogs. Training is what you do with babies. Um, training is what you do with athletes. There is a place in life for training, absolutely. 
Um, it is um, repetitive action. It's habituation. It's um, fundamentally the learning of a skill. In Greek philosophy, it's techne, right? You're learning a kind of technical procedure that you have to engage in. It matters, right? We, we, we all need training in things. Um, and there are plenty of institutions in life that do this, that train us to do stuff. That is different than education. And I want to go back to um, your, your um, curiously named Renegade Institute. Um, free inquiry, open questioning, uh, intellectual diversity. You know, John Stuart Mill, uh, you know, said, uh, he who knows only his own position knows little of that. You know, this whole idea of um, that the, 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 the pursuit of truth, the pursuit of knowledge is an open-ended process. You can't stipulate in advance what the goal or what the end is going to look like. Um, that cuts off intellectual inquiry and that destroys what the academy is all about. But training operates on the idea that you know in advance what the end is, what the purpose is, what knowledge is. And you have these specialized experts who have been trained themselves um, <clears throat> who now can, who now possess this kind of uh, knowledge that they can use to direct you toward pre-appointed ends. And <clears throat> it is, it is uh, ultimately a destruction of the academy itself. The academy has to be a place of open inquiry. It is the only social institution that we have that is dedicated to open inquiry, to uh, non-dogmatism. Training is dogmatism. We know what the end is, and we know how, you're how we're going to get you there. Education is, right, it's, it's, it's Plato's Republic, okay? We're going to inquire into justice, and when we get to book 10 of the Republic, we're going to get to the end of the book, and guess what? We still don't know what justice is, right? Um, because a lot of the questions that we have as human beings are ultimately unanswerable questions. Um, and so this training thing does not fit into the structure of the university itself. And, um, and faculty know this. Um, and, and so the only way um, this is going to be dealt with is if faculty stand up and say, they just ask questions, which is what we do. That's our job. We ask questions. We're, we're inquirers. We're curious. Um, we don't know where our questions are going to lead us. The trainers always know where the questions are going to lead them. And, um, and, and, and so I, I think there has to be within the academy pushback from faculty on administrators, on the whole diversity, equity, and inclusion apparatus, on student life divisions and, and say, you are um, destroying, undoing the very purpose and idea of the university itself. So anyway, I'm sorry, Matt, that was like half an hour. I've gone on way too long, but you, you know, you scratched, you, you know, you, you got me going. So I'm happy to answer questions. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, it's been great hearing your thoughts. And a lot of what you said really rings and it resonates with what I see here on our campus. Um, Non-experts teaching diversity as if there's a, a determined end goal that they understand that others don't. And um, ideas of, of having a particular candidate on a committee, that's new to us as well, that there was talk about maybe we need to have a diversity uh, person of, of different ethnicity on every committee to make sure that the, the rest of us aren't being racist. Yeah. And I, I find that to be so strange. I mean, we, we put it in a recent document, right, that said we're, we need this is a possible solution because, you know, apparently the white people are all racist and need someone to keep an eye on them. And I, I find this sort of, I don't know, viewpoint epistemology or, or a sort of experiential knowledge argument that, you know, that, that there is value in a life and experience, but there's a lot of assumptions that we're just jumping on onto, adding on to it. So. So I appreciate those, those thoughts. 
Yeah, and if I can respond to that, I, I, I think it's a, a, a really great point. And I don't know if you have this on your campus, but I think it's become pretty universal. Uh, viewpoint epistemology has been kind of repackaged in different ways. So uh, when I was department chair, we were having a chairs meeting one day and uh, one of the chairs from uh, another department said, well, you know, that's part of that student's lived experience. And I said, oh, okay. Good. And, and by the way, this is exactly what I do. This is why I annoy people. I go, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, um, can you tell me how lived experience is different than experience? Like, what's the difference between lived experience and experience? And she looked at me cross-eyed and said, I don't, what do you mean? I said, well, I, I don't understand we have, why we have to put the word lived in front of the word experience. Like, what's going on there? <clears throat> and, um, you know, I mean, she was buffaloed by the question. I said, well, let, let me advance this as a thesis that what's going on here is that lived experience is interpreted experience. It's not pure experience, not raw experience. It's interpreted experience. Um, and so then we get to the thing about viewpoint epistemology. Do you have this on your campus, Matt? This uh, proliferation of the language of lenses. We wanna look at this through the lens of this. We wanna look at this through the lens of that. And you, and you just kind of say, well, if you were instructed in epistemology, you know what's going on here, <laughs> right? Um, uh, this is very, that, that, that's not, a lens is not a broadening of our vision. It's a narrowing of our vision. Um, and of course, what education is supposed to be is a broadening of our vision. So I, I, I honestly think, I'm glad, I'm really glad you brought that up. I think, I, I think viewpoint epistemology has become uh, de rigueur on our campuses. And it is used to justify a lot of these kinds of programs. Yeah, whenever we, uh, whenever the administration would like to urge a particular program, they sort of march into the Senate, a bunch of students of color and say, oh, look, the students, we have four or five Hispanic students who feel strongly, therefore we must do it. Or, or more recently, they ran a survey and it, it found something like four to six percent of our students feel the campus is racist. And they said, oh, that's we have, that's their experience and we need to respond to that. And yeah. no one's asking, well, that, that's a very low number compared to national polling data, right? Yeah. That, that means that we don't have nearly the problem that maybe exists elsewhere. No, 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 no. That's 4% too many, right? And so yeah. we all need this undergo diversity training to purge this. And the assumption is because a very small faction perceives something that it must be true of the whole. And that's the problem I have with, with it. You know, Of course, lived experience or whatever you wanna call it does have some value. I mean, whatever your experience is, your experience does give you certain insights, certainly. But when we assume that that is an accurate description of the whole, we yeah. run into some serious problems. Well, and, and, and yeah, and, uh, that's great. And, and I asked that question also, what if, uh, we draw wrong conclusions from our experiences. Is it possible that human beings can draw wrong, wrong conclusions from their experiences? Um, is it possible that minority students can draw wrong conclusions from their... I dare you to ask that question on your campus. I've asked it on mine uh, to, to uh, predictable results. Uh, because I, I operate with the assumption that everybody can draw wrong conclusions from their experiences. Um, and, and so we come back to this uh, kind of thing about, okay, okay, so what evidence do we have that this is actually a problem? Uh, other than um, somebody claiming it to be so. Uh, you want me to, to respond to the questions, Matt? Um, sure. Do you want to, we can start working on some of these? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm happy. Oh, the, look at you people. All right. Uh, Bell me. Um, yeah. The first one asked about equity and equality that you had opened up with a little bit. Wanted you to maybe get into that term a little bit and what's the difference and how does that tie into historic issues of, of housing and financial access that maybe people of color were denied? Yeah. And, and, and so that, I, I think that's a really smart question. And um, so um, equity has a, a kind of twofold uh, meaning historically. One is um, it's related to the idea of ownership. And then secondly, um, um, it, under the common law, you had equity courts, uh, which operated uh, to rectify injustices 
when the general law was not adequate to the situation. Um, so you might have, for example, in a copyright infringement that somebody um, uh, has to pay restitution for a copyright infringement, but under the under an equity court, they'd say, okay, you also need a cease and desist order, which is not part of the law. The law is just uh, rectifying, but you also need an additional measure. So equity courts operated as a, a kind of alongside the common law as a way of correcting injustices. And, and during the constitutional period, the founding period, they were really uh, controversial. Um, um, precisely because they had this kind of remedial function, right? Um, they could remedy, the equity courts could remedy perceived injustices when the normal law was not sufficient to the task. Um, Jefferson was hugely critical, for example, of equity courts because he thought that they were sort of operating outside the law. They were operating outside the normal operations of the law. Um, and they could, they could, perform all kinds of mischief as a result of that. Um, so equity in that sense, um, I think there's something to it, um, as long as you have some kind of controls on it. Um, in the sense that the question was asked uh, about ownership, I'm, I'm, I'm really sympathetic to that point of view. Um, and that is, um, that you should try to create an ownership society. And where you have had situations where ownership has been denied or compromised in some sort of fashion, um, uh, you should be uh, prepared to take some sort of remedial uh, responses to encourage property rights ownership. So to me, um, you know, if equity is used as a sort of defense of property rights, of uh, proprietary classes, of ownership, and so forth, absolutely, I'm, I'm, I'm completely behind it. And where that has been um, denied or um, detracted from in some fashion, um, and, and people think there should become some kind of remedial action, I'm open to that. Uh, but, th but that's not how it's being used. Uh, on our campus. On our campuses, it's being used in this sense. Wherever you have disparate outcomes, you have discrimination. And equity is a rectification of any kind of disparate outcome that you have. Well, disparate outcomes could have multiple causes. Um, perhaps they're a result of discrimination, but they're not necessarily a result of discrimination. Um, and I think that's the mistake that we often make. We treat all disparities as evidence of discrimination. And I think that's a, I think that's a big mistake. That, that really ties into the third question we've got here from uh, Professor Sanchez. He asks um, about that, that use of um, systemic racism and discrimination and how that sort of rigs the game in advance. If, if we're going to, to begin with the idea that any outcome that's different proves discrimination and we can't really question that issue, uh, that that argument, then this, it's hard to say there's not discrimination when when the definition is being given in a way that defines any difference in outcome as as discrimination. Yeah. So I, I yeah, I, and I think so. Part of that is just uh, making that that argument that disparities are not necessarily evidence of discrimination. They might have multiple causes. Uh, but but the, the the argument that Professor Sanchez makes there is an interesting one to me, and I ran into this on my campus after the. Um, uh, killing of George Floyd. Many of the, I was department chair at the time, and many of the departments on campus were issued, as was the um, presidential administration, were issuing statements uh, bemoaning uh, what was, I, I think we'd all agree, a tragic um, situation and outcome. And um, uh, so there's this, this confession of racism. So our president uh, issued a statement confessing it confessing institutional racism and department chairs began issuing statements confessing to departmental racism. My dean contacted me and said, is your department going to issue a statement um, confessing to departmental racism? And I wrote him back um, a, two a two word sentence, a two letter sentence, no. And he wrote me back and said, um, 
um, I think you should. I was like, why wouldn't you? I said, for two reasons. First of all, we don't have a problem with departmental racism. Show me the evidence of that. I don't see any evidence of it. Um, and secondly, it is not the habit of this department to comment on every headline of the day. Um, and then I followed that up. I said, furthermore, we have departments on campus uh, where the department chairs are confessing to departmental racism. All right, I want somebody held accountable. I don't want to work with racists. And it's true, I don't want to work with racists. If that department, if that department is guilty of racism, somebody needs to be held accountable. And I suggest that the person who needs to be held accountable is the chair of that department. So what are you going to do about that chair who's just confessed to the fact that her department is racist? I want her dealt with. Um, I never heard back from my dean after that one. Uh, so, you know, part of what you get in this stuff are these kind of gestures, right? The signaling yeah. um, that takes place. No one's really thought through to the, the end, maybe. And, and, and even the way that we get there is just sort of silly sometimes. The logic doesn't line up. We, we had our own mandatory diversity training recently. And, and in it, they wanted to convince us that we're discriminatory, that we have implicit bias. And so the way they did that was they put up data showing our, uh, our demographic breakdown of our faculty compared to our students and see clearly they don't line up. Therefore, yeah. then that was followed by the, the implicit bias warnings. Now they didn't technically say that we're racist or discriminating, but they're using this data to imply heavily that yeah. some of our applicant pool I mean, our applicant pool looks nothing like our student pool, right? Um, but they're just sort of sloppily, fuzzily using data to get to the results they want, which is you're racist and we want to then justify new policies or, or a survey that just doesn't really work out the way they want, but still is going to be used to prove that we need to have these policies. Um, it yeah. seems like the policy is the end goal and the actual evidence argument logic to get there is all flexible. Um. I, I would add one thing to that. Um, so last time we did a search, uh, um, it was, we have to hire a woman. I'm like, okay, I'm not opposed up to, to that at all. Um, but I asked during the search process, I said, I just want to know, what's the number? What do you mean? Like, how many women do we have to have in our division and on our campus before you'll say, yep, that's the target right there. Well, that's unfair, there's no target. I said, well, you keep saying we need more. So apparently you think we don't have enough, which means that you have some sort of assumed number that would be adequate. Um, and of course my colleagues got irritated with me. Um, <laughs> this apparently happens quite a bit. And, and, and um, you know, but the point was not, uh, the, the, the point is ultimately total victory. That's the point. Um, and that's what they're after is, is total victory. You know, there was a line in your uh, higher, Chronicle of Higher Education article that talked, uh, that said something to the effect of, you know, the, the faculty don't seem to mind that the, the arguments are not solid as long as it gets to the end goal that they share. And, and while while faculty have a, a shared end goal in mind, this is, it gets what you want, whatever, you know, but my worry is when the end goal isn't the same as the administration and the faculty have rolled over and surrendered uh, thoughtful discourse in order to achieve something that they thought was, you know, a common goal, well, you know, where are we left for the next big debate? Uh, we have so many other questions that we're yeah. not going to get to. I want to try to. Uh, okay. One of our students, Alex, listed three different questions. Oh, Alex, way to go. Bring them together as one. But he, uh, he asks, you know, um, well, could the people who organize diversity sorts of programs uh, proceed with the belief that their methods will fail? Uh, he asked, is DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, a passing fad? He asked, uh, when we reach the level of majority saying no, like Virginia elections, will DEI just end before uh, it was something that it was something that was in rather than out? Um, so he's got a lot of questions. I don't know if any yeah. of those sort of interest you, but uh, what are your thoughts about uh, maybe the the lasting effort of this? Will this stick around? Yeah, I, I um, uh. You know, part of critical theory is the idea that all human relations are ultimately relations of power. 
Um, and, and so the underlying assumption, I think, of, um, of uh, a lot of uh, these movements and so forth is that you need to alter power relations somehow. Um, so in the end, it's all about power. And, um, and I think DEI, uh, I, I think there's a legitimate angle to some of it, uh, but I, I think that a lot of it is just a kind of a fig leaf uh, upon power. I mean, postmoderns always talked about how power was everything, um, and I think they actually believe it. Um, and the thing about power is that it wants to congeal. It, 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 it wants to um, centralize. Um, <clears throat> what it doesn't like is dissent. And um, the academy, uh, again, if I'm right about this, the academy is about free and open inquiry and so forth. It's fundamentally about dissent. It's not dogmatic. Like dogmatism is kind of the, the death of academic work. Um, <clears throat> but ideologues who seek power Training is their preferred method uh, because it is a way of subordinating people. It's a way of controlling people. And the expectation is that people won't resist. And the reason why they won't resist is because the stakes are perceived as too high. One stake is I might lose my job. Um, and that's actually a, a kind of um, stake that you can live with. The stake that people can't live with is they'll be accused of being a racist or a sexist. And that is career killing. You can't recover from that. And the people who are running the training seminars know this, right? That, that, that you cannot recover from that accusation. Uh, and, and so training, education um, operates, I, I think Plato's right about this, Education operates on impulses of love. Training, in this sense, not training properly understood, but training in this sense, operates on impulses of fear and guilt. Um, and, um, and that's toxic. That's not healthy. You know, we are really running out of time, but there's a great anonymous attendee question that kind of calls us out on, on, I think you've worked around this a little bit, but you haven't tied in the word liberation yet. And the, yeah. the title of the event was, was should we educate for liberty or liberation? And I think that does tie into what you're explaining right now, but I wonder if you'd make that final connection to, the, to bring in that, those terms, liberty and liberation. Yeah, so yeah, uh, thank you for that, for that question. Um, um, so the idea of liberation is, um, I think, connected to this idea of critical theory. And that is to, divide, to, to see the world as fundamentally organized by relations of power. And uh, that in these relations of power, you have the people who, in some sense, control the mechanisms and operations of power and people who are victimized by it. So you, you divide the world into the oppressors and the oppressed. And so what education is supposed to do is emancipate us. And it's supposed to emancipate us, liberate us. So this is liberation, right? It's supposed to liberate, it, liberate us from um, these kinds of mechanisms of oppression. And that would include um, things such as tradition custom, um, systems, it's, you know, the, the, these kind of carefully developed systems that human be beings have created over centuries, right? I mean, liberal democracy is a system of governance that human beings have created over centuries. The university is a system that human beings have created over centuries. Um, but in the liberationist moment, precisely because they've been created over centuries, they're oppressive, right? They're, they're codifications of power. Uh, and uh, so uh, theory and so forth liberates us from these things. And so part of what our, our trainings do is uh, they bring us to realize how much we've ingested biases. I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's an odd thing to regard biases and prejudices as necessarily bad. 
Um, there are all kinds of biases and prejudices, which are perfectly legitimate for us to have. I told my kids when they were little, don't take candy from strangers, right? Yeah, I remember Thomas Sowell had a passage I read once about uh, the word discriminate, how it used to be a good thing to discriminate, and now it's a bad thing. And yeah, because we're yeah. talking about different things, it was discriminating taste about what flavors or, or culture, whatever, and now it's discriminating rate. And so, yeah, words definitely change. Um, I think and, and, and educating for liberty is simply um, um, not operating under compulsion and the fear of consequences to operate um, uh, uh, un under someone else's will, especially for something that you just kind of know isn't right, right? It doesn't make sense. Um, and and uh, so educating for liberty is um, free thinking, free inquiry, uh, refusing to do things um, that, that you believe in your heart or wrong, refusing to tell untruths. Uh, so the Jordan Peterson thing, uh, Matt, was the thing that got your attention, and and that was a that was a, a fundamental thing with Jordan Peterson, right? Yeah, I mean he he his intellectual awakening was Solzhenitsyn, and that is um, right. The greatest act of your humanity is just the refusal to repeat a lie. And maybe that also helps to answer one of our questions: was you know how do you push back against this? idiocracy without looking like you're opposed to diversity or opposed to people of color or because so often we can be mischaracterized that way if if we're advocating for an open discussion or something maybe that's part of the answer is a commitment to to truth and to an open discussion and um, not necessarily being opposed to diversity uh, heavens no i don't think anyone's opposed to diversity really yeah. but opposed to sort of this mindless march into some unknown or that someone thinks they have a known end conclusion. I, I think it's by doing what we do as academics, and that's asking questions. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but when I've talked about my experiences dealing with deans and trainers and so forth, what I've always done is say, all right, I've asked them questions. Um, right? Ideologies don't deal with questions. They're answer mechanisms. They're not question mechanisms. And um, so I, I think one of the things we do is, um, A, just keep asking questions. Where's your evidence? Where's your proof? Show me that this, you know, how can you demonstrate to me that this works? Uh, I think we keep asking questions. And then the second thing uh, we do is um, at, a, at a certain point, we just say, I'm not going to do that. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, if, if, if the faculty would have, if our faculty would have just said at one point, you know what, this is an infringement upon our prerogatives as faculty, and we're just not going to let you do that. What would they have done? They couldn't have done anything. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight. We are out of time. Our, uh, our, we will all turn to pumpkins here soon, so I have to, to let you go. But thank you so much for your time and your thoughts and your insights. It has been a pleasure speaking with you. Man, I've really enjoyed it. And I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions. I talked too much, but maybe we'll my, wife will, my wife will ver ver verify that. Have a great night. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you everyone. Thanks, Matt.